Welcome to Crypto Land. I'm Krishna Undavolu. Bitcoin gave rise to a new class of millionaires and billionaires. What does that mean for the future of crypto? In 2013, Motherboard went to one of the first Bitcoin conferences ever. It was only like a few hundred people, super low-key and very nerdy. Back then, Bitcoin was a niche obsession for people who embraced its promise of a democratized currency or, depending on who you talk to, maybe just a way of buying drugs on the dark web. Dexter Thomas caught up with the organizer of that event who's come a long way since, and so has his bank account. I'm here at Decentral Miami, which says it is the biggest DeFi and NFT conference this year. And yo, I've been out here for about an hour and the scene is super weird, man. I mean, the line is wrapped up around the parking lot. I saw somebody running around with Bitcoin Balenciagas. There's a Lambo parked in the handicapped spot. There's models. I mean, you might be forgiven for thinking that this is actually a club line instead of a line for a crypto convention. And you gotta be goddamn kidding me. There's somebody running around with an actual Shiba Inu I don't know what I expected when I came here. It was not this. Decentral overlapped with Miami's Art Basel Festival and was largely focused on NFTs, which have exploded in the crypto space over the last year. I have absolutely no idea what's going on. So there's places all over in here. With that explosion have come hundreds of NFT startups. Hi, can I scan or whatever the heck? And a lot of them are here with booths and paid spokesmodels and QR codes trying to get people's attention. And everyone's pretty friendly. If you don't understand what's going on, they're happy to explain it to you. The tokens are still somewhat abstract, but this is how I describe it. I say it's the new stock market for the new internet. One of your NFTs just <laughs> aired out, bro. You got a 404 on one of your NFTs. I gotta get my guy. <laughs> you still need a guy in this world. This is all cool, but it's not the only reason I'm here. I've flown to Miami to meet up with a guy who, in another world, would have still been my co-worker, Alec Liu, former writer for Vice's technology section, Motherboard. A lot of this is still abstract. It reminds me of like Bitcoin 2013. Hey, it's Alec with Motherboard. We're here at the first ever Bitcoin conference in San Jose, where over 1,200 Bitcoin supporters have gathered to celebrate how far the movement's come. This Bitcoin conference in 2013 was a turning point for Alec. He was there covering the event. It's been a crazy, interesting, sort of weird scene. You feel like Bitcoin is entering a new phase. After the event, he quit his job to join the crypto industry. And like a lot of people here, he's doing pretty well for himself now. So is this guy. And this guy. And this guy. On the day of this conference, one Bitcoin was worth around $120. In 2021, when the Miami conference happened, it was worth an average of $47,000. Meaning that every single 20 this guy fed into that ATM is worth a little over 8,000 bucks now. And the comedian they hired for four Bitcoins. My mom is so Japanese that when I was born, I actually came out cordless. In retrospect, had a pretty solid gig. Bitcoin is a tremendous force that can make the world a better place. It's up to us to make sure that that happens. The keynote that year were the Winklevoss. And it was like, whoa, that's a big deal. But there were so many question marks everywhere, right? Like people were talking about this future, but there was so much work to be done. You know, you left kind of feeling like, wow, this was like Bitcoin's coming out party. How did you decide to go from, you know, doing essentially what I'm doing right now right. to say, you know what, right. let me get right. into this crypto thing? I'm definitely a bit of a sellout. Uh, <laughs> I mean, look, money, big motivation, but it's also like the opportunity to be part of like, let's say the beginning of the new internet. Um, that was just a, an opportunity I couldn't miss. I respect that, man. 2013 was this like motley crew of like all different like early adopters, hackers, true believers. But obviously you're fighting a lot of pushback because you know, the mainstream narrative is just sort of, okay, this is this dumb digital currency for buying drugs online. Now it's a dumb digital currency and you can buy really expensive art to put on your TV. <laughs> you have to realize like back in 2013, it was just Bitcoin. I would say the next big milestone was when Ethereum came out 
and now you could add programming and code. Um, that sort of set the foundation for, for what we're seeing today. And the NFT thing has been huge because now it's brought creators and artists. It's a very different crowd. The crowd is different, partially because a lot of new people have come in. But also, some of the people from the early days have changed themselves. What is up, everyone? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am your host, Charlie Schrem. For Charlie Schrem is considered to be one of crypto's founding fathers. In 2011, he started BitInstant, the first truly user-friendly way to buy Bitcoin. He was also a founding member of the Bitcoin Foundation. And he's the one who put on that conference back in 2013. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I really enjoyed it. These days, he works out of a fancy office and lives in a beautiful home in Sarasota, Florida, with his wife, Courtney, and their dog. But back in 2013, his lifestyle was pretty different. Just got out of bed a few minutes ago. It's all good. Thank you. Is anybody hungry or thirsty or anything? I nice to meet you on Charlie's mom. I guess this is down, down here is where all the magic happens. Back then, Charlie Shrem was living and working in his parents' basement. Should I keep my hands here or here? And he had big plans for the future. I want to make the world a better place. I feel like I was put here to do Bitcoin. This is my life's work. And there's a lot more, and I'm still young, so there's a lot more that's going to happen. It's, this is just like part one. A lot more did happen. Just a few months after this interview, Charlie Shrem was arrested on charges of money laundering after more than a million dollars worth of Bitcoin from his exchange wound up on the Silk Road. He pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of aiding and abetting unlicensed money transmission and served over a year in federal prison. It doesn't matter if you're a casual Bitcoin observer, one of the diehard faithful, you need to know what's happening. These days, Charlie Shrem doesn't run his own company anymore. I mean, he doesn't have to, he's rich. Instead, he's leaned more into being a crypto evangelist, traveling around the world to spread the good word. Today, he's flown up to Baltimore, like he does every couple of weeks, to film a video series aimed at investors. But while he was in the area, he wanted to take me by the monuments. What do you think Abe Lincoln would have thought of Bitcoin? He would have loved it. At that conference in 2013, where were you mentally thinking about Bitcoin? I was walking around like my shit didn't stink. They would call me the Prince of Bitcoin. Did you like that title? Yeah, of course I did. It was a cool title. I mean, here I was, this high school kid who had no friends. I was a geek. I was a nerd. And all of a sudden, I'm like the most popular kid in school. And uh, I found an industry that loved me just as much as I loved it. What was your motivation back then? We all realized early days that in this community, what we were doing was special. There was no doubt about it. But personally, for me, I was looking for a family. At the time, I was leaving the very, very religious, orthodox Jewish community that I had gr grown up in. Shrem says that his family made him choose between them and their religion, and his then-girlfriend, Courtney, who isn't Jewish. He chose her and a life outside the community. He hasn't spoken to his parents in years. Do you find yourself seeking some of the things that you did have within your community when you were growing up in Bitcoin? Oh, yeah. One of the things that frustrates me all the time is that growing up in a religious community is you have instant camaraderie or friendship with tens of thousands of people. But in the external world, it's really damn hard to make friends. You came into Bitcoin to find friends. I came into Bitcoin and found some friends. As long as I'm still involved in the industry, I'll always be pushing for that camaraderie and community because it was what got me in in the beginning. Bitcoin wasn't worth anything in the beginning. It wasn't. It wasn't tradable, it wasn't worth. The only reason we started a Bitcoin exchange was just to get more people to get it. Back then, most people thought of Bitcoin as a dodgy electronic alternative to cash, like hipster nerd monopoly money. But the conversation is much broader now. Not only do you have CNBC giving Bitcoin financial advice, but people in the community are promising that the blockchain could do everything from stopping racism and worker exploitation to bringing about world peace. It's pretty remarkable given that we still don't even know who invented Bitcoin. All we have is their pseudonym, Satoshi. Who do you think Satoshi is? Uh, I stopped, I, it's funny, I stopped asking myself that a few years ago. Really? I think what makes Bitcoin great is that there is no Satoshi. Satoshi is probably aliens. Aliens? Well, or time travelers. If time travelers invented Bitcoin to save the world, then they would release it in the way Satoshi released the white paper invented in dip, go back, but not take any credit because you want the people believing it came from them. Or 
Maybe the people invented it, I don't know. A lot of the people who have truly believed in a lot of these things from the beginning, yeah, a lot of them were idealists. Th that's, that's something I hear a lot about. I hear a lot of really, shall we say, optimistic, you know what I mean, utopian thinking right. about, yo, this is gonna stop wars. Right. This is what is gonna- You could fund wars, maybe. 100% fun wars, and this is what I'm talking about. You know, objectively speaking, right, money is a huge part of state and government power. Mm. That That's a fact. And so if you look at it from the perspective of if the state's money gets undermined, you are undermining the state's power. And it's hard not to talk about state power here. The U.S. government has been pretty apprehensive about cryptocurrency in general. Other major global superpowers have toyed with restricting or even banning crypto outright. On the other hand, you've got El Salvador starting to fully embrace Bitcoin. And it's starting to look like governments are realizing that crypto might not be something that they can just legislate away. If you were in my position right now, seeing what you're seeing at this conference, would you make that same step? Or do you think that moment's passed? Oh, it's certainly not passed. We are, everything is very, very early. People have gotten a taste of what's possible. And that's why there's this energy. That's why there's this investment. We've seen enough validation to have the confidence that we're gonna get there. You're supposed to support each other through the spaces. Enough money for everybody to get some. So get you some, you know? A lot of people who are in crypto don't actually care about the technology. They're just playing it like a buzzword stock market. They're in it for the money. But 10 plus years in, crypto is different from the stock market in that the OGs think that they have a shot at actually changing the world. The other side of it that I see is that this is gonna be a new aristocracy. There's gonna be some people who got in early, who got a bunch of Bitcoin. They're gonna be rich, right. but there's still gonna be another 1% and the rest of us 99 are gonna get left in the surf. I think that's always been the story of technology and like big technological developments. It's, it's a double-edged sword. I think what's nice about the framework is that it has that utopian uh, flavor in mind, but uh, this is a very capitalist system. And so, you know, there will be winners and losers. Uh, the hope is that the competition is more fair. And I think we all need to stay vigilant. If you want equity and, and you want fairness, you have to fight for that every day, regardless of the underpinning technology. So you're saying I should quit Vice and follow in your footsteps? There's room for you. There's a huge opportunity now. And I think we need good people fighting that good fight to make sure that this next chapter uh, works for us rather than the other way around. We're more than a decade into Bitcoin's life, and we're here to talk about whether it has lived up to its original promise and how it will shape the future. Here with me are Motherboard's Maxwell Strawn, an early Bitcoin adopter and current chief strategy officer of CoinShares, Meltem Demirers. Meltem, Maxwell, thank you for joining me. A um, lot to talk about, but in order to talk about what Bitcoin is like today and its future, we got to go back in time and talk about how it was born, its history, its culture. Meltem, I I imagine it might be a good idea to talk about your life and how you got into Bitcoin, because maybe it tracks to kind of the larger trajectory of where we are today. Absolutely. I think like many people, um, when I first heard about Bitcoin, it was 2012, and Bitcoin was deeply ideological in nature and very closely aligned with this idea of crypto anarchism. In the early days when I got involved in Bitcoin, it was not about an investment. It was not about making money. It was not about you know becoming a millionaire or billionaire. It was really about how do we use technology to subvert the current political, economic, and social climate and to introduce um, a new thing to the world. And the great experiment we're attempting is the separation of money and state. And as I was leaving grad school, I was like, well, what am I gonna do with my life? Mm -hmm. And then I spent the next three years of my life just completely immersed in the Bitcoin ecosystem, working with core developers, working with entrepreneurs, working with financial institutions. I mean, I made the rounds in 2015 on the street pitching Bitcoin to banks. And mm. everyone thought we were crazy. Everyone thought we were money launderers. Everyone thought, you know, we're like, oh shit, here's the Bitcoin lady. Don't talk to her, she's weird. <laughs> um, but it was interesting. I have such a vivid memory of the day that Bitcoin hit $10,000 for the first time. And we were all gathered in New York because the media company that we ran at the time was hosting the first ever investor-focused crypto event. And I vividly remember I had never owned a nice pair of shoes before. And so 
the moment that Bitcoin hit $10,000, I went on my little net a porte app and I bought like a, a nice pair of shoes for the first time. <laughs> and I had them portered over to the conference and I put them on and I was like, Whoa. And a bunch of us all put in 1.1 Bitcoin each, which is $1,000. And I think it was 100 of us. So we ended up having $100,000 and we threw a crazy party wow. on the rooftop of the public. And we we're all like, what is happening? <laughs> Why is this happening? Because it happened so fast and so intensely. And now we have the capital and now we have the resources, not only on an individual level, but as companies. My company manages seven billion in assets. We're a billion dollar publicly listed company. And I think it's incredible that we have a community of people who are leading with technology. The tenants are open source, decentralized, permissionless. And these people are empowered with, with capital and they're motivated to build. There's no doubt that uh, Bitcoin and all of crypto has a very political origin story. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, you have to remember that when uh, all of these ideas were first coming to the fore, uh, we were in the middle of financial crisis. I think there was a lot of justifiable anger and frustration with the US government uh, bailing out Wall Street banks. And there was a lot of concern about the Federal Reserve and its role uh, in the money supply. Uh, and so, yeah, there was certainly a, a hugely political undertone to the beginning of crypto. From what we can see from surveys and things of that uh, nature, the majority of people buy crypto because they think it's an exciting space. They think that, you know, they could it could increase their net worth by a certain percentage. And those are, you know, that's a justifiable reason to buy something. I think the question is, how do you combine that with the sort of political elements to get to a sort of more revolutionary, decentralized process like she was speaking about? People love to talk about cryptocurrencies as though there's some niche esoteric corner of finance. They are not. This is a $3 trillion asset class that we have memed into existence. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, I'm laughing because it is crazy. Yeah, continue It's wild, that. but we've, we've done it. And I, I think, again, when we think about the investment in crypto, the other thing we have to remember is for many people, it is an antidote to chaos that you can buy in your portfolio. It is a hedge against infinite money printing against trillions of dollars of bailouts, the government incompetence that we're seeing around the world. For many people, they've never had the ability to exit, right? They've only had the ability to voice their dissent. But for the first time with Bitcoin, people who are unhappy with the monetary regime they're in had the ability to exit. Help me understand how <laughs> what that, all of that makes total sense. I think people who don't come from a lot of money, they feel a need to take on risky propositions in order to, uh, in, you know, improve their their life. What I don't quite understand is how those set of incentives are any different from someone who got into house flipping in 2003 or someone who brought, bought shares of Apple in 1995. What is it about crypto that is distinct from those type of risks earlier? There is no CEO of Bitcoin. There is no singular leader. There is no singular investment thesis on Bitcoin. People see whatever they want to see in Bitcoin. So there's a whole group of people out there who are focused on technical analysis and trading, and they're really into the speculative element. And there are all of these different niche sub-communities. But the beauty is Bitcoin is flexible enough to accommodate all of these different sub-communities, and some of them evolve and spin out and, and become their own thing. But I don't think there is like one singular view or singular perspective or one singular ethos. There is no single person who dictates what, what happens. It's up to us. I know a lot of people own a little bit of crypto, but my understanding is that Crypto, for the most part, is highly concentrated. Uh, the, the vast majority is owned by a very small number of people. And is that right? Is that wrong? And if it is true that, that it's concentrated amongst a small number of people, how is that a democratizing force? How is that different from, you know, uh, how assets are uh, uh, divided uh, through Wall Street or sure. anything like that? This is a great question and one I, I love talking about. So in our existing monetary system, wealth is extremely concentrated. And today, um, whales control about 12% of the Bitcoin supply. But what's really cool whales is being people whales who, being people who own more than 1,000 Bitcoin. Okay, so that's 12% with the whales. With the whales. But then the really cool thing is there's an extremely long tail of smaller Bitcoin holders, um, and that long tail keeps growing. That provides them with 
more resources to you know, do, do what they want to do. So that long tail is, is growing, but we need to find more ways to, to help it grow. But that sounds like you're identifying a solution to what is a problem, yeah, which sure. is to say it isn't democratized at the moment, so there has to be a way of making but it But how better. do you propose we create a new world currency and distribute it fairly, right? Like I'm not here to answer that question. Sure, like yeah. I, don't, I don't even know if we need a new world currency and distributing it fairly. You are. If we want to change the world and the power structure in our world, we have to start with the money, okay. because at the end of the day, everything comes back to the money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, what I'm really advocating for is like, let's consider this as a potential tool in our toolkit, along with a variety of other initiatives and technologies that can help us start to find better answers to some of these systemic challenges that have plagued humanity since, since the dawn of time. Like, so what is happening with the wealth that's created? Because I think that, that might be the way to talk about this question, because like, so what, what are we doing, what are you guys doing to make sure that that wealth actually does benefit a large swath of people? Yeah, I think there are a few different approaches. I mean, I think so. Are you paying taxes? I pay taxes, of cool. course. How, how, does it, how does it work with taxes and Bitcoin? And how do you think it should work? How should it be well, so, and, and Yeah, exactly. And sure. The reason I think this is an important <laughs> question is because like, we live in a society, right? And our governments are- We live are, in a society. Yeah, our governments, <laughs> our governments might be broken, but there's a lot of attention these days paid to whether billionaires or people who've made a lot of money are paying their fair share into broader based programs that are decided through democratic means as to how we have better roads or how we move to a, a, a greener economy, these sorts of things. So if you want to keep everything within the crypto world and you never cash out, then when are you ever going to pay taxes? And when you do will pay taxes. You pay taxes on like kind exchanges. So if I trade my Bitcoin for another cryptocurrency, that's a taxable event, just like it would be if I bought Google shares to buy Apple shares, cool. right? I think the issue is if we look at how taxpayer resources in America have been spent, on waging endless war. Broken, agreed, yes. totally destroying, agree. destroying but the, countries. But, but also to defend Medicare, the dollar. social security, public school. Of course, but if we look at what we get for the amount of tax we pay, in America what we do is we take public resources and we put them in the hands of private companies. Tesla, billions of dollars of tax subsidies. So I think the issue we have here is there is so much grift mm. with public sector resources flowing into the hands of private corporations. That's what I take issue with. That's where the inequality stems from, is that we don't live in a democracy. We live in a corporation state. Mm -hmm. So if, we, if our tax structure looked more like Europe with nationalized health care and lower defense spending and things like that, how would that affect your view on uh, how taxes should be employed in the U.S.? I mean, look, the, the only thing I can say is um, we can sit here and we can pontificate, and that's great, and we can complain. But if there's one thing I've learned from seven years of being in this industry is at some point you just have to shut the fuck up and build it. Mm. And so I am going to help put people in office. We need to create a new political party. I don't think the two-party system in America works. And I think we're now at a point in the crypto ecosystem where we have enough resources, we have enough wealth, and we have enough people who view the world through the same lens that we can actually start to enact real change. And it's not us sitting here around this table talking, it's us putting people in office who are going to change things. How much actual wealth has been created through Bitcoin? So just basic facts today, Bitcoin is a $1.2 trillion asset class. Bitcoin is anywhere between 40 to 50% of the overall crypto asset market. Put assets on a relative scale, right? Crypto, $3 trillion market. Precious metals, literal fucking rocks, $12 trillion market. Okay. Okay. Global equities, $100 trillion market. Real estate, $300 trillion market. Apple is a $2 trillion company. Microsoft is a $2 trillion company, right? They have budgets that are bigger than the budgets of nation states. Right, so the, the, the but, general so solution, I, 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 So like, just if you take a step back, right, like crypto is not the craziest thing that's happening. We're living in this interesting world where corporations, right, have more power than nation states. They have more resources than nation states, which is a dynamic we haven't seen before and is the result of there is so much money in the system. Mm -hmm. So crypto is the least surprising thing to me, and it's 
so blatantly obvious if you put it in context. I, I agree with all of the problems you've stated today. <laughs> I just have trouble wrapping my head around is why crypto is the answer to any of those things. Like what makes it so different or what about the decentralized technology? I've never been able to understand how that helps solve things outside of it being another market or something. How does it solve some of those issues? There's a great Satoshi quote, and I'm gonna use it, because like the gospel of Satoshi is real. And it's, um, if you don't understand, I don't have time to explain. So I do think there's an interesting thing. I spent the last seven years of my life trying to explain and convince various people from all walks of life about the significance of Bitcoin. And again, like money is just a shared delusion, sure. right? Like money is just a collective fiction. I'm trying to convince you of my view, my delusion, right? But it's very difficult for me to convince you of my delusion because you're trapped in your own delusion, which is the I'm not trapped. Fiat I'm not trapped. And, <laughs> and it could be that sure. the benefit of crypto is that it moves resources from this traditional hierarchy of white men who work at Goldman Sachs to a totally different group of people. And that might be fine. I, I think that's, that would be a good thing to have a more diversified I think the most powerful respect. thing that Bitcoin has done and the most dangerous thing that Bitcoin has done, it has helped people understand that they have a choice. So Maxwell, I want to talk to you for a second because we've there's a lot of big ideas and in your reporting on inequality in tech, what are the red flags that you see coming <laughs> out of this conversation? You know, what, yeah. what, what makes you uh, want to push uh, back the Tell me the about the red, <laughs> my red flags. Yeah. I'm dying. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, you were just talking about, you know, uh, spending, you know, money on ludicrous things. That seem, to me doesn't seem like an issue, to be honest. Like, rich people have been spending money on stupid stuff for thousands of years. I, I think... But the, or maybe millions, who knows? Uh, uh, <laughs> they were trading wampum for like sick cave art. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah, NFTs, whatever you think about them. Some people think they're innovation. Some people think that they're, you know, going to be gone. I don't know. I don't really care. I don't know if there is a red flag, but I do find myself still confused about outside of Bitcoin rising in price, uh, Bitcoin uh, allowing people back in the day to buy nefarious drugs. I, I, I'm just having a trouble seeing w how it's solving any of these problems. And it, obviously people think that it does because like you said, there's a religious element to it. There's a real devotion to it. And early adopters, I think, understandably, really feel attached to crypto because uh, especially in the case of Bitcoin, it's changed a lot of people's lives. And if you were there early, but if, I, if we're starting today though, if you're starting to get into, you wanna buy Bitcoin today, I wonder, are, do you think you'll be, uh, are you too late to the party or are you still very early? You don't have to buy Bitcoin though. You can earn Bitcoin. You can get paid Bitcoin cash back rewards. Like, what we want to start to do is create new dynamics where you don't have to buy sure. it. The choke point, the control point, is always going to be where crypto touches the traditional banking system. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're really focused on is building the ability for people to never have to leave the crypto ecosystem. We can now enable people, and there's actually a really cool company called Stackwork that allows, it's like an Upwork or a Fiverr where people can get paid in Bitcoin. Um, so if you're a developer, right? so for example, if you are a university educated woman in Afghanistan, you can no longer work outside your home. But right. If you have an internet connection, you can work online and get paid in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to deposit in a bank account because as a woman, you can't have a bank account. Right. So you can now empower people around the world to work for Bitcoin, which is pretty cool. That, that is a tangible benefit. How, how big is that? How big is that? How, how often is that happening right now? All the time. And there are huge developer communities in Argentina, in Chile, in Venezuela, in Turkey, where I'm from, in the Philippines, in Malaysia. Um, so we can now allow people, anyone with a phone and an internet connection can get Bitcoin. And I think that's super powerful. You and I don't feel that pain because we live in America and we have bank accounts and we've never been marginalized or excluded. But I think for people who haven't had those opportunities, like this is tremendously exciting for them. I think that that is a super exciting opportunity. Don't so then, you you yeah, have the, to agree the with question, that. Yes, it, of course. But then the question is, but it's will not. this tide actually lift all boats? And I think that's the, the inequality sure. question in a nutshell. And here's my answer to that. Like, I 
can't decide that for anyone, Nor right? Can I, because right. value is deeply subjective and deeply personal. And we're still super early. Like the technology to be able to do these things is like three years old. What happens with that? That future is up to people to, to build and decide. This is permissionless financial technology. So people will, will build different things and some of it will make sense to us, some of it won't. Some of it will be altruistic and well-intentioned in nature, some of it won't. But my only job is to empower people to build the things they want to build and to try to move the movement forward in a way that's positive and value creative. Um, and that's all I can do. Mm -hmm. I will say that the one thing that makes me concerned is that... Uh, is the that, one thing, or are there many things? I feel like it, there are many things. Is that, uh, you know, this is essentially unfettered capitalism. There's, it's ca capitalism without the state, by definition. That's the ideological underpinning of the whole thing. And there's a lot of history that shows that that's not a dem democra uh, democratizing thing all the time. Does it end up benefiting society writ large? Does it rise all boats? Uh, or does it help a concentrated few? Uh, I don't think we know yet, but uh, it's, worth, not written yet, but it's like, worth asking until it does. But by telling these stories, like we can help shape the direction of the story. Yeah. But like we have to, we have to go forth and do. And I know, Melton, we've been hard on you to some it's degree. Okay. I but can I think take it's, it. I think it's because <laughs> so much rides on what the early wealth earners of this community do with it. Sure. And how it becomes something or just becomes another thing. Like, I think there's a lot of promise here, and I think the technology itself is, like, is there. But that story is for us to, to write. And by holding people accountable and asking the hard questions and forcing the conversation. I don't even have the tools to hold people accountable to this. I don't even know what the right questions are because it feels like, yeah, the sky's the limit. Okay, well, thank you both for this wide-ranging and conversation that's not over is how oh, I feel about it. It's just getting started. So thank you. Uh, and thank you for joining us. That's it for us today. We'll see you next time.